So this is my time machine. It has taken me all over the world. And very soon, I will explain to you how it works. But first, let me take you back a few months, to the 23rd of June, to be precise, in Madrid, Spain. I remember vividly this day. I was suffering the dry heat as I went into the International Institute, one of those grand old buildings in the city center. I was about to meet all the other Spaniards who, like me, had received a Fulbright scholarship to come to study to the United States this fall. And I'm not going to lie. I felt intimidated and terrified, as if any minute they were going to come up to me and tell me that I wasn't on the list and that it was all a mistake. <laughs> but luckily, that didn't happen. So I joined a group of people who were introducing themselves and explaining what it was that they were going to do over here. So the first guy was going to study quantum physics. <laughs> the second guy, marine evolutionary biology. The third guy, something related to teledetection. And I looked at him, trying my best to pretend I knew what that was. <laughs> but of course, he must have understood I had no idea, for he went on to explain that it is the science that gathers information from objects and phenomena that we cannot touch. And then my turn came, all eyes on me. And I must admit, I felt a little bit ashamed to say that I was coming here to study filmmaking as if all of their fights were worth fighting, and mine wasn't. But thinking about it, I think that this is precisely what Fulbright is all about. Empowering people from all disciplines to achieve something remarkable within their fields. In my case, I've always been obsessed with traveling and filmmaking. And it must have something to do with the fact that my father is a cinematographer who has traveled the world. While I was growing up, this is what he was doing. He would send me postcards from Cuba, Costa Rica, Mount Everest, and I fantasized about visiting those places myself. But it was also really sad to see him leave. So one day, before going on one of these great adventures, he told me a little secret. He said, you know what? My camera is actually a time machine. So whenever you miss me, all you have to do is watch the pictures and the videos of when I was still at home in order to bring me back. I didn't get my very own time machine until I was 21. It was right before starting my great backpacking adventure through Southeast Asia. And this is when my two passions came together, because I loved traveling, but traveling was even better when I could use my camera to edit my own version of the worlds I was discovering. I could focus on what caught my attention, and I could cut out what didn't. So I started my journey. And as I have always been obsessed with Coppola's Apocalypse Now, a movie about the Vietnam War set in the Mekong Delta, I decided to dive deep into this area of Vietnam. Looking back, I'm not sure of what exactly I was expecting to find, especially because I later realized that the movie had been shot in the Philippines. So one afternoon, I was lost among the twisted dirt roads of the Mekong when I somehow started talking to a woman and her daughter. The girl was learning English at school, so she could somehow translate for us. Now, I thought of myself as a little kid back then, but they must have seen me in a completely different way. The little girl asked, where's your family? And I said, in Spain, where are your friends? They're not here with me. And your husband? And I said, I don't have a husband. I don't even have a boyfriend. And then she looked at me very, very, very seriously and asked, are you happy? <laughs> and I could not help but laugh, because even though it was hard for her to understand, I was indeed incredibly happy. And it got me thinking about how differently things can be perceived, depending on the perspective you take to look at them. So this is one of the many memories that I will forever remember from that trip. And what I realized was that it was women like the ones I had met on that hot afternoon in the Mekong Delta who had impacted me the most. 
ordinary women that play an extraordinary role within their families, their communities, and their countries. So back then, I didn't have the knowledge, the skills, or the material to create a proper movie. But I felt this burning desire to create a movie about these women, and more importantly, for these women. So this is how I did my very first short film, which is called Heroinas, which is feminine for heroes in Spanish. It's very short and simple. I recorded the voiceover locked in my bathroom. But it conveyed a powerful insight, and it sparked in me the desire for more. I wanted to travel, find new heroes, tell their stories, and I had no idea of what exactly I wanted to do, or even how I was going to do it. But I knew something way more important, why I wanted to do it. And it was not only because of how awake and alive it made me feel to explore the unknown, but also because I thought that I could have a powerful, powerful impact on the audience. Back then, I was still a journalism student. And in class, we had learned the criteria that make a story newsworthy. So they are things like proximity, magnitude, novelty, property destruction, amount of people who die. And I remember thinking that these parameters didn't necessarily define the kind of stories that I wanted to tell. I wanted to capture colorful and captivating characters that have the potential to inspire us, to motivate us to take action, maybe even to enrage us. Because I think that it is through these characters that we can travel in time through our crazy world, and more importantly, figure out how we fit in it. Because when we learn to see others, to listen to them, to understand them, we are actually learning a great deal about ourselves too. So one day, my friend Raquel Vázquez, one of the most inspiring women I know, called me and asked me if I wanted to go with her to Cambodia on a National Geographic Young Explorer expedition. Now, at that point, the Khmer Rouge genocide had long ago stopped being newsworthy. But I said, of course, let's go, because I knew that there were still a lot of stories to be told. We knew that that was a time of fear and violence, a time in which you could be murdered just because you wore glasses, which meant you were literate and a potential threat to Pol Pot's rural utopia. But we wanted to go beyond that. We called our project the Khmer Experiment because it really felt like an experiment. We started a journey into Cambodia's open wounds, using Buddhist monks as our vehicle into the past. And why them? Because overnight, they went from being the spiritual leaders to the parasites of society, who had to be educated. And by educated, I mean tortured, murdered, subject to forced labor, forced to marry and consume their marriages, and made to abandon their beliefs and their way of life. We tracked down, interviewed, and recreated step by step the journey of many monks who endured that spell of horror. And even though we realize that it will never be possible to properly honor all of those who suffer, we still think it is important to be able to revisit that time through the memories of these monks. It is important today, and it will be important in years to come, when the survivors are no longer around. And like this, I've done many other experiments. The common denominator being the desire to see the world through the eyes of characters that can give us a relevant version of their reality. Because as I said before, things will be perceived in a very different way depending on how we choose to look at them. So for example, a few months ago, I returned to Cambodia. This time I was going to work with landmine victims. Now you would think that this would be a story of hatred, of revenge, of lost opportunities. However, when you look at this tragedy through the eyes of nine-year-old Toy, you realize that it can also be a story of gratitude, of happiness, of the desire to play, of the ability to reach new and better opportunities. I also like to think of my adventures in terms of experiments, because one thing I've learned is that having better or worse resources is not always what will make the biggest difference. Or at least this is what I like to tell myself, because I've never had access to a lot of money. So, for example, Raquel and me traded English classes for Khmer translations. And let me tell you, it wasn't that easy, 
because we had to chase teenagers at night who clearly had better things to do than sitting next to us listening to the account of genocide survivors. Luckily, translating was not an issue when I went to Latin America to do a documentary about primary education. In this case, optimizing my resources meant hiring my brother as the sound engineer <laughs> and my father as the cinematographer. So the whole family was working together again, except that this time, I was the boss. <laughs> and I don't know if you've ever been the boss of your dad, <laughs> but I highly recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to say things like, we are doing it this way because I say so. <laughs> so you can imagine the face of those who went to the airport to pick up a film crew and found a family. The good thing was that we were very easily welcomed into the homes and the schools of the most vulnerable and isolated communities. Once, we were in Colombia, and I saw this group of five-year-olds, and they were having this really intense discussion while they were having this, their breakfast. So I went close to them to overhear their conversation, and I realized that they were actually having this very intense debate to try to decide whether my father was Father Christmas or not. <laughs> but don't let him fool you with his white beard, because he has the energy of a 20-year-old. We followed an insane rhythm. We could be filming in the outskirts of Santiago de Chile in the morning, to then jump on a plane and fly to Panama City, to then jump on the back of a pickup truck and drive for hours until we arrived to an indigenous community in the middle of the jungle. And he would then jump off the car, get his camera, and be ready to go for a hike to find the best spot to film the sunset. And the truth is that when you do what you love, you will always find the strength and, and the energy to go a little bit further. This is why I'm always ready to say yes to the next challenge even though it might mean giving up my family, my friends, my stability, the possibility of ever having savings. <laughs> but I had also learned from my father at a very early age, whenever I saw him leave, that doing what you love also demands a lot of sacrifices. So this is my time machine, and it works for me, because it represents the possibility of telling stories. And I know that as long as this is what I am doing, I will keep feeling like a young explorer. And I will never lose the desire to be surprised and wonder. So I encourage you to find your very own time machine, whatever this might be. And once you find it, hold on to it. That thing that makes you feel fulfilled. And that thing that will become your weapon to fight in the fights that you consider worth fighting. Thank you very much.